Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Mental Health Professionals Network webinar this evening on our topic of um, collaborative care for a young person with grief, loss, and trauma. It's an interdisciplinary panel discussion, as um, the MHPN webinars always are. Currently, we have 370 participants logged in online, which is fantastic, and we had 1,600 people register for this webinar, which is um, a record for the MHPN. Um, my name is Mary Emelias. I'm a GP in uh, Cairns in far north Queensland. I'm also a psychotherapist and I work at Headspace. Um, I was in council for four years and now at Headspace in Cairns for two years. So the young person that we're talking about tonight is somebody that would be familiar to me as to all of the members of our panel. Now I'd like to um, just introduce the Australian Child and Adolescent Trauma Loss and Grief Network. Just going to get the slide for you with that on it. Um, so, the, this webinar is supported by the network. So, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about who they are. Um, so, we, we do particularly want to thank them for their contribution and involvement tonight. The network targets psychological trauma and/or loss and grief suffered as a result of serious accidents, injuries, illnesses, or life-threatening events witnessing threats or violence to family members or other loved ones, child abuse and neglect, severe bullying, violent, sudden or unexpected deaths of family members, loss and changes in family, friends and other important relationships in schools and communities, life-threatening experiences such as disasters, terrorism or other major incidents. So you can see that's a very um, wide variety of events that can affect the, the people that we work with. And in fact, a number of tonight's panel, which is Penny, Shane and Beverly, are involved in the Australian Child and Adolescent Trauma, Loss and Grief Network. So I would like to introduce our panel members. Um, I'd like to introduce Shane first of all. Uh, Shane is a psychologist from New South Wales. Just a reminder that the um, biographies for the presenters were sent out in the information about the webinar. So if you want to find out more information, please um, return to that. But Shane, could you just um, tell us a little bit more about the work you've done looking at Indigenous experiences of coping and resilience? Um, so I'm an Aboriginal man. I'm a Kamilaroi man from northern New South Wales. Uh, I've been involved and I'm a psychologist. I've lectured in um, mental health uh, and counselling Indigenous mental health specifically along the way in grief and loss for, for quite a few years. I've been involved in a lot of steering committees and on a lot of... Um, um, panels and committees over the years. Uh, I've been involved with the Mental Health Professionals Network before, but I've also been involved with um, a Catlin, um, who, who you just talked about, um, as a consultant, but also as a steering um, committee member. Um, and I've had a lot to do with the Indigenous hub of that website. Um, yep. And um, I understand that you did some particular work around coping and resilience. Uh, that's, uh, I've done some articles. Uh, it, you'll see in my presentation that I've done an article on um, grief and loss and complicated grief and loss in specific um, Aboriginal populations. That's drawn out of my PhD. So a lot of my PhD was around cultural safety, around the need to decolonise psychology, um, and I looked at resilience within that. Um, so Aboriginal resilience and the need to redefine terms when you're working with Aboriginal people or Aboriginal communities. Well, I'm really looking forward to your contribution to the panel. I think it will be um, really interesting and, um, you know, add an extra dimension to what we're talking about tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome Penny Burns as well. Penny is a GP. Um, Penny, how did a GP get involved in adolescent trauma, loss and grief in, to this depth? How did you become interested in that? Um, I've actually... Um connected with Beverly Raphael, who was one of my previous professors, and I was um, very interested in disasters and uh, studied that at James Cook University, um, and then um, started looking at the effects of um, disasters on populations, and, and particularly the role of the general practitioner in supporting those communities after disasters. Um, and I'm now actually doing a PhD on the role of GPs in disasters. Um, so it, it sort of went uh, from one thing to another and I'm also currently on the New South Wales Mental Health Disaster Advisory Committee as well which um, 
um, advisors on response to disaster. So it sort of went from one thing to the other. Thank you, Kenny. And I'd like to welcome um, Professor Beverly Raphael. Now, Beverly, you're on the panel as a psychiatrist, and I, I, I understand that you wear um, very many hats and um, have been active in a, in a lot of different areas of mental health. What, what particular um, things do you, parts of your roles do you bring to the particular case of Jeremy this evening? What well, interests you about Jeremy? Many things about Jeremy. He's aloneness, the fact that he's uh, probably an Aboriginal boy, we don't know. Uh, he's with an aunt who's really supporting him but not there much time. And I'm interested because he's got both physical symptoms and potentially mental health symptoms. We suspect he experienced a lot of trauma and loss just because of the lack of a family around him at this young age. So I think it's a chance for us to make sure we look after all the sides of his well-being and that's why I'm really keen that the panel addresses all of those themes. I was a general practitioner once, and so certainly from both work in Indigenous populations and with colleagues working closely. We've done a lot of work about children and trauma, and we know that Indigenous children are far more likely to experience it, suffer multiple trauma. So we're very keen to know what's happened in his life and the physical and mental health issues. Thank you, Beverly. I wonder if you could move your microphone just a little closer to your mouth. Some of the participants are having trouble hearing. I think you can just move it a little closer. Is that better um, now? Yes. Thank you. And um, last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome um, Scott Truman. Now, Scott is a mental health nurse by background and is currently um, working in a university role as well. Scott, it's, um, some, some of us are not so used to working with mental health nurses and I know that you were commenting just before we came on, on air about perhaps a, uh, some of the differences in your role. So I wondered if there, just briefly, what, what particular things um, a mental health nurse might bring or keep in mind when seeing somebody like Jeremy? Oh, well, in relation to um, uh, Jeremy, for example, as Beverly said, he's clearly isolated from his family and the like. And so um, whilst the GP may be obviously involved in a psychiatrist and a psychologist, um, a more regular point of contact uh, needs to be established with Jeremy. And if a referral was made to a mental health service, then obviously a mental health nurse would be able to have more frequent contact uh, and on a more regular basis with Jeremy uh, to build up a, a relationship between the mental health services. And, uh, and the patient. So um, it's that frequency and intimacy of contact on a regular basis that the nursing uh, perspective would come from. Thank you very much, Scott. Look, look forward to your contribution as well. Now, I just wanted to um, remind us all about the learning objectives for tonight. So this is particularly about how we work collaboratively to look after people um, in mental health care, in the primary care setting particularly. Um, so what, what we're hoping to get out of tonight is that we, we might better understand the mental health indicators in the context of grief, loss and or trauma in young people, that we can identify the key principles from the featured disciplines um, regarding their approach in screening, diagnosing and treating young people exposed to grief, loss and or trauma, and to explore some tips and strategies for interdisciplinary collaboration between practitioners dealing with young people exposed to grief, loss or trauma. And I'm, I'm certain that all of our uh, registrants, of whom there are now 484, as well as our panel, know that one of the keys to working with traumatised young people is actually that you can't do it on your own and you need a team. So um, we are tonight talking about Jeremy, who we've mentioned already. So he's um, presented to you in the case that you received before the webinar. In summary, he's a 13-year-old boy who's recently moved from Central Australia to live with his single maternal auntie in a major city. He goes to the GP and he confides a physical health problem. Um, and he, the GP notices that he looks tired and drawn and fidgety and he might be in some kind of psychological distress. So um, I would like to invite Shane, first of all, to um, show us uh, how he might first respond to Jeremy. I'll, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the ground rules. 
I've done lots of these webinars before, but one, I haven't actually done one for 12 months, so I apologise that I'm a bit rusty. Just, um, just be mindful that what you write in the chat box is visible to everybody for um, our participants. So be respectful and behave as if this were face to face. Post your comments and questions to panellists in the general chat box and if you have a technical problem, go across to the technical chat box. Um, and remembering again that everything can be seen by everybody. And your feedback is really important and a lot of the things like the choices of topics that we use and presenters, suggestions for um, future panellists um, have come from feedback. So please um, feel very, very welcome to feedback. We appreciate it. In the bottom right hand corner of your screen is a documents tab and the case study is in that. So if you wish to open it so that you can see it and refer back to it during the activity, you're very welcome to do so. We've been through the learning objectives and uh, I would now like to invite Shane um, to respond from the psychologist's perspective. Thanks very much, Shane. All right. Um, we've talked a little bit before about the case study there are a lot of indications there that Jeremy might be Aboriginal. Um, it might not necessarily be obvious to the GP or whoever's done seeing Jeremy that he is Aboriginal and he may not be comfortable disclosing his Aboriginality either. So I think there's a lot of things that you can't assume one way or the other without without talking to Jeremy. And I think the important thing is, is no, it's, um, as Beverly said, you've got to get a, a look at what's happening in Jeremy's life from Jeremy's point of view. Uh, me as a psychologist and as a counsellor, I would see that it's really necessary to build a rapport with Jeremy because it's not likely to happen otherwise. Um, there are some really possibly alarming um, points in the case study that I think as a, as a psychologist or a counsellor, but certainly as, a, as a, um, a health professional in general, you would be flagging. You would have, I always go into a case with a working hypothesis and I've flagged almost everything that, that could possibly be an issue ready to explore or ready to seize the opportunity to explore if, if Jeremy gives me a way in. Um, I think if Jeremy came to me, I would probably have a referral from a GP or possibly from a psychiatrist, um, talking about the model disciplinary term, but also I might possibly have a discharge summary if Jeremy had been hospitalised um, for, for any physical or certainly mental health issues. Um, there are some protective factors that are, are really good indicators um, and are reassuring in the case study, like his relationship with his aunt. I mean, it's concerning that he's moved, but we don't know that he's moved necessarily for bad reasons. It might have been cultural reasons that he moved. He might have moved to, to go to a different school to get a better education. Um, it might be horrible reasons as well. We don't know at this stage. Um, as the other panel members have said, there is a lot of um, concerns there physically and, and I would leave that up to the GP to, to look at um, the, the stuff of the urine passing and um, also the scratches might be indicative of something. Uh, I was talking to another colleague who specialises in um, child and adolescent um, care um, and she basically pointed out something. I, I had a lot to do with writing with, with Jeremy Kate, um, but it didn't occur to me that the scratches might actually be from his aunt. His aunt might actually be abusing him physically or sexually. Um, so you have to be really open for, for following those um, hypotheses through and not having a closed mind about anything. Um, I'll, I'll probably put too many things on my PowerPoint, but I'll talk them through now that I've given you an overview. Um, You've got two minutes. <laughs> Have I used three already? Probably. Yes. <laughs> Confidentiality, I think, is a big issue given Jeremy's age. We, we don't know. Um, is he capable of giving consent to treatment? But usually, probably, it would be his aunt who brings him to me um, to close the gap. So, um, Jeremy has a right to treatment, even at 13. If he were like 14, for example, he could actually um, give consent to treatment without his guardian or his carer's um, consent. So, at 13, it's pretty tricky. I put up the, the table, which is very dense, but I put it up more as a, um, a resource for people to have. Um, I, I put it in specifically, there are a lot of things on the left-hand side that might be relevant, but the idea that he might, Jeremy might be at this 
stage where he's trying to differentiate himself from his parents. So it might be necessary for him to be away and it might be a possible um, positive thing for him. Um, again, as a psychologist, as a counsellor, I don't think Jeremy would open up unless maybe even there's the Aboriginal thing, maybe it's appropriate that I'm a male um, and that might be um, helpful in him um, opening up a bit more than otherwise he would. The, the idea is this person-centred approach and the, the importance of unconditional positive regard. Cultural stuff, narrative therapy can be really helpful um, for dairy. The deep listening might be really um, culturally appropriate but effective. I would really put a lot of emphasis on building the therapeutic alliance in the relationship with, with Jeremy, especially at a 13-year-old um, at that age because you would need to put in the groundwork to get, to get Jeremy to feel comfortable with you. Uh, obviously, I would look at Jeremy feeling empowered in this and including his aunt, if possible, his extended family, even though they're distant. Um, if they could be involved, that would be wonderful because it's about a systems approach, ideally. Um, so the other thing is I'd try and look at it in a strength-based way. There are a lot of indicators here that, that he has a good support network or he could have but also the, the importance of um, acknowledging the strength that Jeremy brings to the table and not being the expert and talking down to Jeremy, actually getting Jeremy to explore the issues that are, that are um, salient to him um, and identifying the protective factors. And I mean, there are quite a few risk factors that might be evident in the case study. The reason I've put that up there is not to publicise my own article, which I am now doing. Um, it's also mm -hmm. because um, it talks about a lot of the trauma-related issues, the grief and loss issues that might be relevant for an Aboriginal 13-year-old kid. So I thought that would be a good resource for people. Thank, Thank you very much, Saint. I'm I'm sure that it will be. And I've um, there were some questions that came in from the participants beforehand. We now have 526 participants um, about engaging how to engage somebody like Jeremy. And I think that you've answered a lot of that really beautifully for us. Um, I would like to now invite Penny um, to give us a response that she might have as the GP who's seeing Jeremy. So Auntie has brought Jeremy to see her. What kind of things, Penny, might be going through your mind when you meet Jeremy? Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, I just had a quick, um, a quick uh, couple of slides initially on just on adolescence, and I'm sort of presuming that Jeremy may be Indigenous, but I don't know that. So I guess I'm approaching it from a fairly generalist point of view, and. Um, and one of the important things about adolescence health is that they're about a fifth of the Australian population and they've got quite significant diversity, whether Indigenous or whether culturally from somewhere else. Um, and the major issues um, in adolescence are accidents and injuries, mental health burdens and behavioural problems. But the three commonest reasons that the GP would see a young person is for respiratory skin or musculoskeletal conditions. So, you know, I have, I have acne, doc. But every time we see an adolescent, we're always wondering about what else is going on with that person, partly because it's an opportunity to um, interfere with the, the fact that the adult disease burden is associated with conditions and behaviours that begin during adolescence. So it's a really big opportunity for us to be able to see adolescents and engage them um, in a really broad way. And Jeremy's story is incredibly multifaceted. And when I saw it, I thought, wow, I could spend two days with Jeremy. Um, usually we um, have 15 minute consultations in the surgery but for first consultations we would normally have a half hour so we have a 30 minute consultation um, and if we know it's going to be long people will sometimes make a longer one but it's still a very short time to go through this huge amount of um, issues with Jeremy. So I have to admit, I, very similar with um, Shane, the absolute priority is to engage Jeremy and also to connect with his aunt but you have the advantage of already knowing the aunt as a patient so you have a huge amount of background data there um, about Sharon and about her family and what she's like. Um, but engagement with Jeremy is absolutely crucial and it needs to be done um, at Jeremy's level um, and it needs to be taken very, very slowly um, and done in a way that's acceptable to him. Um, he needs to feel safe and he needs to have his concerns addressed. Um, and there's obviously confidentiality issues that Shane's touched on and then there's med medical legal issues about consent. Um, and it's different in every state but, um, and Jeremy's at a, t a difficult age for that with 13, but a socially mature adult 
especially mature adolescent, um, can consent to treatment themselves in certain situations. So the commonest um, tool that general practitioners would use is probably a HEADS Adolescence Health Check and you may um, be familiar with that. Um, there is one in the, um, there's a NACHO document that has one um, that's a very good printout um, for Aboriginal uh, teenagers and that's very useful. This in itself could take um, take several consultations before you actually get through it and sometimes it's very difficult to um, to approach early on but it's, some, it's a really good basis for starting. In the history taking, the, the conversation initiation is really important. Um, it's important to ask Jeremy permission for what you're, what you're asking him and also to um, speak to him in a way that he understands and without talking down to him but in a very sensitive way. Um, so you know, you might start with, is, is it okay if I ask you some questions about or um, some adolescents your age like to and, and do it that way. Jeremy um, has also got some concerns that he needs addressed and it's very, very important that those are addressed as well um, because that's the reason he's come along. So if he goes away without having those addressed, he, he feels that he may feel that the consultation wasn't what, what he was after. It's also important um, in the history um, to get as much as you can from Jeremy that's appropriate at the time, but sometimes you also need to go outside um, Jer Jeremy's um, knowledge and ask permission from him to talk to his aunt or to talk to his school um, to gather more information. The physical exam here is again a really difficult issue. He's got um, certain signs that make you want to examine him, yet um, if he has got issues of trauma or grief, um, it's going to be a very difficult um, thing to do and sometimes it may not be possible to do it until the third or fourth consultation. It doesn't need to be rushed, it needs to be done slowly and sensitively and you need to have a good rapport and a good trust with Jeremy because he needs to allow you to do that. Now there are also opportunities in physical examination. Um, simple things like asking him if we can do his blood pressure allow you to roll up his sleeve and see a little bit more of his arm and see what's going on there. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other um, issues here with his weight and height and his scratches on his skin that you would need to address. But again, in 30 minutes we would not be able to um, cover all of those and we'd need to come back another day to some of those. The key would be to get him to come back. There is an item um, 715, sorry I've got a typo there, um, to do a health assessment as well. And again that could be another thing you could get him back later um, to do to get a more comprehensive coverage of his health. So the important things in, in at the end of the consultation are that we've actually managed to develop a connection with Jeremy and that he feels safe and engaged with us. Um, and if nothing else happens other than that, then that's probably the most important thing. And the second important thing would be that he was um, he understood the plan of management that we developed with him and he understood how to access ongoing care if he needed it, so how to come back and see us. Um, adolescents often have trouble understanding Medicare and they don't have their own Medicare card and if they don't have support from an adult, they may find it very difficult to walk back into the surgery. So it needs to be very adolescent friendly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny. Um, I guess it, it um, is it's just, I think it was raised by a lot of the participants that, um, you know, Jeremy's main problem is his burning pee and you, you know, identified really well that that, even if that's all we achieve is engaging him and having his concern met around that, then that gives us the opportunity to follow up later on with other things. Um, so I, I actually think GPs are in a, in a really, um, we, we have actually a lot of, um, power and influence which we don't always recognise and, and can really, because we're allowed to address the physical problems as well, I think it's often a key to engaging adolescents which is really helpful and then we can um, invite our primary care colleagues to come in and give us a hand. So I think that was very helpful. Now um, one of 
one of the professions that we might well refer to as a GP is a mental health nurse, in, at least in some private practices. And so I'd like to invite Scott now to have a response from the mental health nursing perspective. Thanks, Scott. Thank, thank you, Mary. Um, yes, my, uh, my um, <clears throat> lens of uh, talking about Jeremy here is uh, quite different from the previous and the uh, following speaker in as much as a lot of the um, interventions or plans which would involve a mental health nurse are really contingent upon what the uh, referral is from either the psychiatrist or the person and uh, what um, the position of the mental health uh, nurse is working in. For example, if the nurse is working in the same GP practice as uh, a mental health, say, nurse practitioner, or um, if they are working in a, a say, adolescent and child uh, mental health service, uh, working in a government department or service, health service, then of course uh, the response or the interventions with Jeremy uh, will be uh, quite different. But that said, um, it's quite clear that uh, this young lad uh, is uh, at risk, and the greatest risk that I see is that him slipping through the uh, cracks or never engaging. And uh, I agree uh, with respect uh, with the other um, uh, panelists that uh, engaging uh, Jeremy is the uh, greatest um, uh, need at this time. And it may be that the GP uh, is able to see the uh, see Jeremy more often, but um, if that is not the case, then a therapeutic service or to a mental health nurse uh, provide a service whereby regular and more consistent engagement uh, could be undertaken. Now the second point on that first slide could have been the very first one. So much of this is contingent on the level of consent and engagement that Jeremy actually wants to make. And uh, that is, uh, if Jeremy uh, engages, then it makes it a lot easier uh, to provide a holistic care and uh, support to him and uh, his uh, significant others. But if he doesn't, then uh, that's going to cause uh, some um, problems, which we'll discuss in a minute. The central question uh, from my point of view uh, is, and I would want to get either from Jeremy or from the referring GP slash uh, psychiatrist, is uh, why is it that uh, Jeremy uh, has moved from Central Australia uh, to be isolated with his, uh, his aunt? Um, the, the central question for me would be, uh, why is that? Is there issues of uh, death or loss uh, of her parents? Is there issues of neglect? Is there issues of abuse? Uh, I just simply don't know, uh, but they are uh, central also to determining the future career of uh, Jeremy, I would have thought. Jeremy's 13 years of age, as the others uh, have uh, um, um, discussed, um, he is um, uh, not under 12, uh, but he's certainly not 18, so he doesn't have autonomy to make his own, necessarily at law, make his own uh, decisions in regard to his care. It's interesting that he was prepared to come along and see the uh, GP, but then he wanted to do it in private. So there's sort of, on the one hand, a level of engagement or a power of, um, per se, and then on another, there is perhaps a lack of, namely when he pulls his head away. Uh, it would be very much the case that um, the GP uh, would have to make a Gillick decision based on that legal case Gillick and determine whether, even though uh, Jeremy's thinking he has uh, competency, uh, the, the ability, to weigh up the decisions and give consent. Uh, again, I stress, this will greatly influence the manner of future and management. If there's little or no engagement, uh, and certainly uh, he was either not competent, and didn't, uh, or if he was competent and didn't give consent, then there's huge issues of confidentiality. Who, in fact, uh, is the person that would be able to provide the consent for any ongoing care? Um, the aunt, maybe, but certainly maybe not. Uh, the parents, well then, if we need to follow the parents up, uh, the issue there is that uh, we have cultural, perhaps, problems or issues, and uh, we also have the, uh, the issue of um, uh, are we going to do more damage than harm if we are trying at the embryonic stage of this therapeutic relationship to establish it and foster it and, uh, and mature it. 
Um, it's quite clear that there could be an indigenous um, aspect to this. Uh, if uh, Jeremy does uh, identify as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, um, then uh, there, there needs to be uh, m uh, this central to the care that is provided and the ongoing planning in regard to, uh, uh, to Jeremy. And um, uh, that would require taking um, advices uh, from those people who have the uh, requisite uh, knowledge and skill in regard to the protocols that would need to be undertaken in that regard. Certainly, if he were referred, that is Jeremy were referred to a mental health nurse working in a, in a service, uh, that's one of the first things that they would be wanting to do is to engage in appropriate uh, culturally safe uh, resources and assistance. GP uh, referral, it could be made to, as I said, a child and adolescent mental health team. And uh, certainly, if that uh, was made, then there would need to be um, um, frequent uh, case management, particularly at the, at the early uh, stages, in regard, in involving both the GP and a psychiatrist, and if there was no referral made uh, to a psychologist. Um, and those uh, team meetings would have to take place on a regular uh, basis. If the referral were made to such a team, uh, the mental health nurses would have um, to engage, as I said, culturally appropriate uh, indigenous local resources uh, and they'd have to uh, undertake appropriate uh, culturally um, uh, manners of uh, interacting with Jeremy, such as art therapy, narrative therapy, yarning with, uh, with uh, Jeremy as we go along. One of the big issues here, though, is that um, Jeremy's uh, engagement, as I said, really um, depends on whether he faces the service or not. The interesting thing here is that how are you going to get a, a, a history from Jeremy if he doesn't give consent and he is judged competent because if the parents still live interstate in another state or territory, then you've got cross-border, cross-state uh, issues of accessing his uh, prior medical history. And uh, I think that that would uh, add a, uh, another level of complexity uh, to this uh, case. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just pop through those slides. For some reason, the um, video has frozen, but I'm sure the technical people are onto it. And in fact, I can't. Uh, there we go. OK, the slides have advanced. and. Um, Beverly, oh no, I just wondered if I'd gone past your first one. So um, Beverly, we would like to invite you to respond as a psychiatrist. Now I, I guess that we probably Jeremy may have seen other practitioners before he comes to see you and um, it, it would be um, really useful for us to hear how, how you would approach someone like Jeremy when he has been referred to you. Firstly, of course, I'd take notice of the referral uh, words and what people have felt about Germany, but I would really like to uh, be tuned in because we know that many children experience adversity, our research has shown it, and certainly Aboriginal children, with these Aboriginal, have experienced it at much higher levels. And we know that childhood adversity is one of the things that can have so many impacts in different ways. And I think that we have to be tuned in to the trauma component, and I'd certainly be gently exploring what, what his experience has been and also what information we've received from whoever's referred him uh, to a psychiatrist such as myself and how we can take into account the complexity of things that have been probable in his life. Uh, being in a big city from a remote place and no knowledge yet about his family, his origins and his experience in the earlier stage of his life. Um, we would be, of course, concerned about family conflict, uh, his schooling. There's no mention of his schooling and is he in school now because the capacity to support him in school is a critical one. Uh, possible health problems. He's clearly presented with what appears to be a physical health problem and we don't have any answers as yet as to exactly what's going wrong, either self uh, for him himself or whether he's been subjected to some abuse there's a strong sexual issue in the theme of it being uh, in his genital organ, which is what he describes his peeing. It's 
experience and the pain of it. So it would suggest an infective process. We don't know anything about that in detail. Of course, the general practitioner will have uh, addressed that because that's the primary thing that's brought him to care. So it's the challenge for collaborative care is us all working together and playing a part. Possible health problems, the possibility of abuse, separation from family, uh, separation from culture. We don't know whether his answers have true impact. Uncertainty about what is happening in his life now and uh, what sort of social support does he have. They're the sorts of things which will be able to uh, influence a Germany's life when we understand better both the physical and the uh, psychological symptoms. The issue of grief and loss has come up very powerfully and it's very likely that he's experiencing loss of his familiar place even if it was associated with unhappiness and trauma because we all uh, are influenced particularly early in our development by the threat of, um, of our lives, we're influenced by that, but we're influenced by the nature of family and the strength and the identity of being part of a family and part of a community, which is very powerful when you're in a relatively small and isolated place. So he must be experiencing some grief and loss about that, let alone the losses that might have occurred and premature death very common in Indigenous communities from accidents and a range of other factors. So our concern, Jeremy, is both in the uh, experiences he might have had in the past, how they're interesting now, his story, story of what he's last been about, and it's absolutely right what everybody else said, that engaging him, making clear that we're not just interested in his feelings, but we are very interested and concerned in work, walking with him to get the physical symptoms better and to deal with them in ways which will be you'll be able to understand and feel better about and also to uh, support him in a sensitive way because uh, we want to both respect his culture, his needs and the, the strange experience of being an adolescent boy and growing up and what this world got to offer me and what was my past world like. So distress and anxiety may be common experiences for him, we need to understand that better. He's still a child in a lone place place because he doesn't have other family except his aunt. Aunties are very important in Indigenous culture and often they're very powerful and supportive people and she seems to be very supportive from what we heard. But he, he's old enough to want the privacy that he asked for in the interview. So he may have a lot to tell, a lot of stories he needs to share. And a lot about that will influence what we understand about his mental health needs. And we have to look at the fact that he may have experienced physical or sexual abuse, um, he may have been neglected, <coughs> there might be transgenerational trauma as it so often is in families and circumstances, Indigenous families particularly. Um, his aunt is there and seems to be a solid carer for him, but it mentions in the briefing that she's away a lot, long hours. So what were his lonely times like? Who does he turn to? And what happens in his life in a day-to-day -day way? I think they're critical parts of this understanding. <clears throat> so it's mixing our experience, the sorts of things that Scott said, the sorts of things that um, we discussed in terms of Penny's view and his general practice engagement, and I think to the issues that Shane expressed so clearly, it's highly likely there's sadness and grief in his life, and we need to really be with him and walk with him to help understand that and be with and walk with the team, the group of us, in ways which are all sensitive and collaborative. Now asking the right questions is part of this. <clears throat> what sorts of things make you feel unhappy or making you sad? That's a question that I'd like to ask because most, and you can also sh um, shape this in the idea of um, you know, many young people have times when they're sad and unhappy, and, uh, especially at this age when you're growing up and everything's changing in your life. And that's an opportunity to hear that bit of the story. So how do you feel in yourself? These are the sorts of broad general questions and they're very similar to some of the things that Scott was saying. It's opening up, what sort of things have been worrying you? And has this worry been around for a long time? 
How do you feel about your situation now? And <clears throat> what do you like? What do you do well? Tell us about yourself. And these are only a start and they're just my words. I think it's very important to have natural and open words and to take that discussion along a path that he responds to and seems to be okay about. It's an important time not to have too structured a question, not to bring out the checklist, but to be, bring out the heartfelt feelings and wish to understand and be with him in the journey of his story. I think they're critical and I think that's what good clinicians, good doctors and, and the people with skills described in the panel do. So I think we have to be tuned in and be open and ready and encouraging him for his story, both in the worry he has with wing and the worry he has with life and the scratching him himself or someone else doing it, the hurt, the wounds, the have probably been part of where he's at now. And Thanks, sorry. Oh, sorry, Beverly. No, that's right. I was just over to you. Thank you very much for that. And I think what um, what you said has been really uh, resonating with a lot of the conversation in the um, from the participants. There are five hundred and eighty nine people online now, um, and I think people are really saying that the, that the key thing is to is engaging him. Um, recognising that he might be really frightened and not, not rushing in to make any conclusions or foreclose yeah. on what might be wrong. And I think it's important for the participants to know that the, what, what we're really doing here is speculating on what the case makes us think of and the MHPN cases are deliberately very open and with very much information that we don't know because that is the reality of the work that we do. When we see someone before us presenting with one thing, there's always a a great big story and that's why we often need a number of different people working collaboratively. So in this case everyone in the chat room is, is pretty much agreeing that what he's presenting with is to the GP with a P problem and that's probably the thing that's going to help him engage. Yes. Beverly, yes. I'd like to, we're going to open up into um, the panel having a discussion about how we might work together for Jeremy and I know that you had a, a question for um, Shane which was really around, uh, we don't really know why Jeremy's with his auntie. So I wondered if you just wanted to have a talk with Shane about what, what you were thinking about how, how Shane can help us with what might have led to Jeremy being here. Yes, I would like to and I think it's really important that Shane himself is an Indigenous man. Uh, he may be more able to discuss with Jeremy some of the things that are coming up in Jeremy's life that um, are okay to talk about because it's a male person and also because it is part of the cultural background that they're both shared, even though it might not have been the exactly the same cultural setting. I think Shane has uh, brings the wisdom and the capacity from his own experience as an Aboriginal man, but also his work with other Indigenous communities in tuning in and knowing the safe questions to ask and the ways to take a sensitive issue forward because that's what we're talking about in the primary way that this boy has presented with a sensitive issue. The fact he told it yes, it's off is also indicates that it's a very big thing for him and we need to address that as well as his anxieties and fears. So Shane, can we get your, your help here about how we might understand um, what, what might have been troubling Jeremy in the remote community he came from? What kind of things might you be thinking about? I think at his age, I think um, you can't rule out experimenting with drugs and alcohol. Um, you can't rule out self-harm. You can't rule out suicidality at the moment, um, depression. We've certainly got the evidence in the case study about the... the can, you, can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. So I'm just waiting on the um, technical support to bring back the videos of everybody because we are now in the discussion section. Right. But we can hear you, so keep talking. I'll keep talking. Uh, uh, so we've, we've got evidence that he's not sleeping well, that he's got interrupted sleep. Um, we've, we've got the scratches, like I said, might be sore palm. I think there are a lot of things there that might be really concerning and I think 
I think it's a really tricky one because sometimes you get somebody coming from a rural or remote area and it can be protective um, living in a tight community but then sometimes it might not be, it might be a risk factor. Um, if a lot of Jeremy's peers uh, or, or some older um, kids as well are, are experimenting or making Jeremy do things he doesn't want to do, he, he might have fled that um, or he might be trying to deal with it in his own way. So I think there are a lot of things there that might still be issues and we would really need to know from Jeremy and take the time to, to not feel the pressure to diagnose too soon and find out from Jeremy, hey, what's actually happening with you? And um, as Penny said, it might, it might need obviously extra sessions um, where you can get that, uh, that time to explore all of these really, really important issues. Thanks. Shane, uh, I've got a bit of a delay between the video and the sound, so I can't always tell when you stop talking. Um, okay. The other thing is we, we can't put all the um, videos up at the same time because the audio will suffer, so that's sure. why we're just going to have one person on um, at a time. Now, um, Shane... Sorry, I'll Mary, can I say one more yeah, thing? Sure. Um, did, I, did I mention Shane? Uh, Shane for Aboriginal people, especially... I mean, you've got a lot of pressures when you're a 13-year-old kid especially a 13 year old boy anyway, but this overlaying factor of, of this Aboriginal sense of shame, let alone the normal shame that a 13 year old boy would feel about his be hurting. So I think that's something that you really need to negotiate as well. It might very well be that the, the shame was why he didn't want his auntie in his room, not, not necessarily because it was a, a gender difference, but because of the shame factor of, of yeah. what, what's happening with him and what may what that may mean, like whether it's an STD or whatever. So I think you've got to really negotiate this idea of shame and it, and it could be very hard for someone like Jeremy to admit weaknesses in front of people. And, and uh, Shane, someone in the participants has brought it up and I was also thinking that we actually don't know if Jeremy is Indigenous. We think that he might be. But that issue of in my experience, the uh, Indigenous view of shame has helped me to think about shame more broadly and any 13-year-old yeah. boy with this kind of problem is um, likely to be feeling embarrassed and awkward and, and, and a sense of shame. Um, and it, so and I it might be. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so was that Penny? Because I was about to invite yeah. you to <laughs> comment on how you would deal with that as a GP. I was just going to say, I have actually seen adolescent boys who come in with this um, strange discharge that they weren't sure what it was and they've chatted to it about with their friends so in a rural area and they've all decided that it's okay because they've all got it. Um, but this one child's ended up coming in and, and it has ended up being um, a, an STI in this particular situation. But it is very difficult. I find that for me one of the important things with... Um, adolescence is to have very frequent contact initially to develop that rapport. I find it very hard to um, to get very much of the history initially and I find that it's really important to go slowly and so I will often end up seeing them fairly frequently initially to establish that rapport and then I'm very careful about referring on. Um, I, I run it, past, I, I discuss it with them and obviously they're involved in their care but to send them to too many referrals or too many other um, people um, can sometimes be a bit scary for them. So this is something that I would take very, very slowly. Um, but there is also a concern with the UTI in that um, you do want to, or it may not be UTI, the, the urine, the dysuria, um, you do want to actually find out what that is um, because there is a higher risk of kidney disease in children, in Aboriginal children. Um, and it, so it is actually medically very important that that's addressed. And so even though a lot of these issues are, are around psychosocial, you know, in the future we don't want him to have um, chronic renal failure. So there are some very important physical things there that need to be addressed, albeit very slowly and very carefully. Yeah, and again, I think that's one of the really good opportunities in general practice that we actually often miss, especially when we're you know, we, we don't have enough time, but engaging somebody like this and assertively following up his medical problem that he has presented with that is worrying him, those consultations where you order tests and you see him again and you follow up, he, he begins to learn that you can be trusted. 
And then when you open it up to talk about the, head, the wider area in the heads assessment and then maybe suggest the involvement of other people mm -hmm. who's more likely to trust you. And I, I've been um, noticing in the um, discussions from participants there's a question about if there, if there does end up needing to be a number of people involved in Jeremy's care, how do we hold it all together? You know, do we need one person that's kind of the coordinator of everything and is the GP place to do that? How do we decide who that should be? Do you have any comments on that or perhaps if anyone else from the panel wants to speak up? Um, my, my feeling on that is that Jeremy probably ends up deciding. Often it's the GP that might um, be the coordinator but um, if the person who relates best to him um, can sometimes end up doing that coordinate coordination and Jeremy is the one that is directing that with, with, with guidance but it's very important that he's happy with who he's seeing um, and so I, I feel that it doesn't necessarily have to be the GP, it often is the GP but in some circumstances it might be the psychiatrist or the psychologist or the mental health nurse who's, who's really guiding where um, Jeremy's being referred. Now, um, yes, welcome whoever that was. Please go ahead. Uh, it's Scott here. It, I, uh, from my experience, I'm not saying that the uh, the team leader, if you wanted to use that that phrase, uh, is necessarily uh, the GP or anybody. But I've often found that the carriage of the day to day matters is often if a referral is made to a mental health service uh, done by that mental health team, and then collaboratively have regular uh, team meetings with the uh, with the specialist. So Scott, do you have any trouble getting um, specialists and GPs to participate in those kind of meetings? Um, no, no, uh, but uh, they're often time poor, let's put it that way, and uh, just the, near, the sheer lack of GPs that are available uh, makes it problematic. And um, certainly in a place like Cairns, for example, uh, it's extremely difficult to find private psychiatrists or, or GPs that uh, have the time to enter into those. It's not because they don't want it, it's just the reality. So do you have any um, any tips on how you how you could involve um, the GP and the psychiatrist? Um, I'll go to Beverly after this as well. But how, how could you involve those people in a collaborative way when you might not be able to all get together in the same place? Well, often um, uh, from my experience, the, the, that uh, there can be um, correspondence uh, by way of a discharge letter or referral letters, and then um, I've often found that if the parties can't get together, um, that often um, uh, phone calls after hours or, um, can facilitate the uh, transferring of information. Certainly, it's easier if everybody is part of the same. Uh, uh, medical record um, system and are able to share those access to those records, but that is uh, not uh, that's more of an exception other than the rule. And Beverly, I wonder if you could um, comment on 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 how you've been able to be involved with um, these complex kind of cases um, as a psychiatrist. And I guess sometimes you might not even be in the same town. And, and also, uh, there's a, a, a question from the um, audience, if you could follow on after that, um, just, just a little bit more about the actual elements of grief and loss that might be present for Jeremy. But if you could start, you know, how do we address sensitive issues like grief and loss in a collaborative way, including Jeremy, when we have, you know, professionals with different needs and times and funding? Well, I think in this day and age... In three words work. or less, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they work in the same facility, it's very hard to have a conversation except by a teleconference or something like that. And I think you can do quite well with it. But you do need to have someone who's the identified person that will make it happen. And uh, sometimes it's a, a person in the practice. But it's the person, as Penny said in a way, that should be the lead agent. is the person that Scott identifies with and feels he can talk. And uh, the rest of us should fall into place alongside that uh, in a collaborative way, but tuned in with the expertise each one of us might bring to answering the question of the, the 
queries and the problems that he's facing. So there might be a need, for example, to liaison the school. Uh, there may well be further developments following the findings of testing the troubles he's having with his wing. But alongside this, it's how we keep the support going in a generic sense as well as the expert support from perhaps counselling and other ways of support that he can tell his story and deal with any trauma that's happened in his past and grief particularly. We often used to set grief aside or just think it was a trauma. Often the two things happen together but grief is the great sadness and most little children even recognise sadness and know when someone's got a sad face and I think the sadness that can be there in young people can last a long time it, and it's often associated with a sense of worthlessness and emptiness and especially if you've lost your mates, even if they weren't good mates, if you've lost them, you can feel sad and grieving and quite often because of the primitive deaths in many uh, remote communities, particularly indigenous communities, you, you are likely to have family losses. We know in research that's been done in those settings that there's a higher rate in, in my own experience um, with indigenous communities. Premature death is a very common thing to accidents and other things. So loss and grief are common. And the sadness is the start, the angry, the self-blame and the emptiness may continue unless there's comforting, counselling and support. And particularly the support of others who are capable of showing you affection and kindness. The ordinary human things, the goodness in people which often comes out when they're offering support. And we shouldn't push things. This is the only way to do it. I think sometimes there's an expectation. There's a magic way, but listening, caring, being there, having eye contact, and showing you care about what's happening in his life will be very important things for Jeremy to get the feel of, as well as the words. And uh, Beverly, I, I've noticed that um, in you're approaching this in a very holistic way, which is in fact not, um, well, from maybe this is unfair to say, but it's not in a sort of typical medical model way. And um, I, I was wondering actually, perhaps, Scott, if you could comment on, um, from, from a psychologist's point of view, we're having a lot of questions from the um, participants around, um, you know, the interactions between, um, actually, I meant Shane because he's a psychologist, but I said yeah, Scott. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just around, when you're not a medical person, you're not a doctor or a nurse, how, how does, you know, what are some of the difficulties around that interaction and how, how have you found ways to work with doctors and nurses um, when clearly the thing that Jeremy needs is, is someone that, that he relates to as a person. He doesn't actually care what profession we come from. He's interested in who is hearing him. So Shane, could you talk about that a little bit? Um, I just, I just think it's um, as Beverly did it so, so beautifully. She, she peppered the holistic view with, with the practicalities and the physical symptomology and, and what she would be looking for, and vice versa. So I think it's, it's, um, it's finding. Finding that way to tie in the the broader ways of looking at things and the and the, the uh, for example in um, Jeremy's um, case whether he's Aboriginal or not obviously the context is important um, so having those dialogues um, with your team um, in that collaborative way where where like for example if if there was a focus too much on the physical and on the diagnosing then I would. I would throw in a conversation starter about the more holistic contextual stuff and, and perhaps about the cultural stuff as well if Jeremy was Aboriginal. So I, I think it's um, working as that team, um, introducing the holistic stuff and you might be surprised, um, like, like um, Beverly, um, the, the, the conversation itself might change in nature because of that. Now I'm just aware that we're um, approaching the end of our time and um, you know there's a very lively discussion in these participants and in one of the one of the, the things which you know obviously we take feedback on board but that a lot of our discussion is speculation but I, I guess in reality when we the very first time we meet someone particularly somebody like Jeremy for 
15 minutes, all we can do is speculate. And I think that was your one of your early points, Shane, was that, that we must begin with an open mind. Yeah. And, and, and keep, in fact, keep it. And so I just wondered if you would like to give us a couple of sort of key points that you'd like to, to finish up with and then I'll go through um, the other panellists to, to see final comments from them. I think, um, and this is because of my research and, and, and what I do, I think you have to look at a strength-based approach and, and foster re resilience in children and adolescents in this case, but you also have to look at the, the context, at the structural issues, at, um, at disadvantage, at cycles of um, disadvantage. I think as well, given rural and remote, is that extra layer of disadvantage. Um, I think you need to commit to empowering the young, um, whether that's in the therapy room itself or just in general. Um, we have to look at the broader stuff about reducing discrimination, reducing oppression, reducing racism and poverty in some in some parts. Um, I think another another salient point that keeps coming up for me is you, you might have these battles with Jeremy feeling comfortable enough to talk in regards to confidentiality, but what might be the real issue is as he asks for his aunt to wait outside. So his aunt knows something's yeah. happening. But the salient issue for Jeremy might, might be more about privacy than about confidentiality as a blanket concept. So I think in a, in a way, if you understand that and check that with Jeremy, it might free up how you work as a collaborative team. Thanks very much, Shane. Now, I'm, I'm mindful that I cut uh, Scott off before when he was on the screen. Currently our videos are frozen, but I'm quite confident the sound's working. So um, Scott, I wondered if there was a couple of um, points that you would like to sort of make sure we go away with. Yeah, from, from my perspective, um, I agree with everything that's been said um, in relation to the, the level of, or the importance of engagement uh, with Jeremy. It's so important that he just doesn't slip through the gates or just does not mm. engage. Uh, the big question for me is his age, he's separated from his parents, we really need to drill down and find out why that is and we also need to be careful and take into account that at some stage we're going to have to try and get a history and if it's from another state that's, that could very well be very pro problematic. The other issue is that uh, I don't want to uh, appear as though I'm naive, when we were talking about holistic care and bringing uh, parties together for team conferences. Uh, I, I spoke about you know, the, the lack of GPs that are available, I, being time poor. Uh, because of the time of talking here, I didn't get around to talking about, well, you know, psychologists perhaps only have 10 sessions to work with people. Uh, social workers may not uh, uh, get an invite or may not uh, fund to do that sort of thing. OTs may get missed out. It's very problematic because all of the systems are so stretched and uh, that is the reality. But we're all, I'm sure, mindful of this and trying to work towards it. That's all I've got to say. Scott, I just think that's probably the critical point. I mean, we are talking about Jeremy and, and the issues around grief, loss and trauma, but it, it is extremely hard with yeah. a bits and pieces system, with people working in private practice and um, public practice and some practitioners are located together and other people are trying to make a living out of Medicare and the Mental Health Nurse Incentive Program and OTs and social workers often get forgotten and it's yeah, really it's difficult. The different funding models, it just does not, it just does not assist the willingness of all of the practitioners wanting to get together. It, it, it impedes it in fact. Yeah, but I, I guess the, the the, the good thing about the discussion tonight is realising that if we keep Jeremy at the centre, we can somehow find a way to make it work. Um, I think I'd like um, Penny to just give us your final thoughts uh, following our discussion. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, I agree, obviously, with everything that everyone else has said, but I guess I think one of the things um, from the G point, P point of view that happens all the time with patients, not just adolescents, but with um, all sorts of patients, is not to miss the opportunity when someone presents with a medical condition they're concerned about to look at all the other aspects of their health and to um, to go slowly um, engage them and then slowly work with them um, to achieve what they want. My second point is, having seen a number of um, 
adolescents with um, sort of medically unexplained physical symptoms, I think we need to be very careful not to over-medicalise and, and refer them off here and there without um, carefully thinking about the impact that that has on their control over their um, own health. And I agree with, um, I just want to say something about Scott's point about the, the difficult with finding time. The thing I've found is that I like to put a fair amount of time in early on when I first meet someone. So I'll see them quite regularly and quite often and try and um, have phone calls with um, other um, specialists that are, or um, allied health that I'm going to refer to. Um, and I find that putting that time in earlier on that means I can pull back a little bit later on in terms of that valuable time. Thank you. And the relationship with the, the, the young person or the client is, is, is strong and they know that they can come back to you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for that, Penny. Now, I've, I've been rushing us through, so I'm going to let Beverly have a little bit longer. Beverly, you can have three minutes. Oh, my goodness. Look, I think this has been really important as, as a session because we haven't solved the mysteries. There's a lot that we don't know that we need to know. Holding on with and being there for uh, this young boy, Jeremy, is a really important thing. You, now I think all of you have mentioned that he might be lost, a lost from us. He's got a strong person in his arms who's brought him along and has been able to let him speak privately. I think the comments about shame are true for many young boys, but particularly Indigenous young boys, as uh, Shane Mer mentioned. And I think there's also the importance of not um, missing out on the physical health issue, which has been his first uh, card into this uh, care system. I think too that we all have good intentions about keeping in touch and working collaboratively. But what Scott said about the time demands is true. So we have to make sure that there is someone who is going to be there across the time. And this might well be the general practitioner who is likely to be there and uh, hopefully will be able to see him. So many people change within the healthcare system. So continuity of knowing someone you trust, having to go to a different doctor every time, a different nurse every time, a different psychologist after a few sessions, it might be uh, very helpful to have a few sessions because if you, you've built trust, you want to be able to turn back to someone you know, understand something about your problem. So trying to have someone who's got a chance to offer some continuity, at least for the coming months until some of these things are sorted out a bit better will be really important. And that person having part of their responsibility to have a continuity of links, be it by email or whatever, to keep all of us up to date about what can be most helpful and if we need to come into the picture. I think there's a great deal of goodwill and I think it's really, really important if we can um, mobilise that. I think when people see that they care about and when someone can show their kindness and concern, it makes a very big difference to feeling that you're worthwhile and to feeling that you might be able to trust this person and come back and see them again. I think every one of the panel has shown that that's the capacity they have and most uh, professionals in this field do. But we don't often tune into it because we're either stuck for time, don't have the chance to spend more as Penny suggested, or else we're driven by a risk averse culture which says we've got to fill in our form before we do anything else. The most important thing to this young man will be someone who can meet his eyes, he shows them and can hear his story and can act. And make him feel at least that he wouldn't be afraid of coming back. He wouldn't be ashamed of coming back. And he'd carry a little bit of hope that he must have been there. I think Thanks so much, Beverly. I think that's a fantastic point to end on, um, Dad, that there, it's about mobilising goodwill and building a relationship with this young yeah. person and that hopefully can leave us some hope. Yes, and that someone going to do something about the problem he expressed and the other problems that are, we believe are likely to be crowding in on his life. And um, again, there's lots of really lively discussion in the uh, amongst the 587 <laughs> participants, but also about the, the creating of this open space where Jeremy's 
questions and Jeremy's strengths can be drawn out. And also there was a really interesting comment that often if he was attending school, the person that he might actually be comfortable talking to might be somebody from school, a counsellor yeah. or a guidance officer. And I guess from what I, I'm imagining, all of us would be happy to include that kind of person in um, we would consider that really important. So, um, thank you so much to all of our panellists and thank you to all the participants for your contributions. It's been very lively and um, I must admit I'm, it's been very hard to keep an eye on everything so I apologise if your points haven't been raised um, with the panel. So I'd like to, uh, to thank Shane for bringing us the psychologist's perspective and also we've been really privileged to have, um, have your um, participation as an Indigenous man and um, to give us that perspective of, of how things might be for Jeremy and encouraging us to keep an open mind. Um, I also found your distinction between privacy and confidentiality mm -hmm. really helpful. Um, and um, then Scott, I thank you very much for reminding us that we need to keep development in mind so that um, what he might be going through at his age and also things like the realities of, um, you know, legal issues and consent and cross-state borders. Um, and Penny, I think you've reminded us of the really strategic position that GPs might have as being a continuous care provider in somebody's life over a long period. Um, but I think you've cautioned us about not over-medicalising things. And I, um, I'm appreciative that there are some general practitioners in the audience tonight and I, I guess it would be my wish that we could get this message out to all of the GPs in Australia to be keeping an open mind and um, not over medicalising things too early <laughs> and that the relationship is really important. And Beverly, um, there's been very many comments in the chat box just appreciating your holistic view and your respect for all the professions with whom you work. So thank you all very, very much for your participation. Thanks to all our participants. Make sure that you complete the um, exit survey before you log out. So after the session closes, the exit survey is going to come up on your screen. Um, if, when you complete that, you will receive a certificate of attendance in about four or five weeks time. And as I said, we do listen to your feedback. All of the resources mentioned tonight, the slides and other resources that have come up will be sent to you via a link in the next couple of days. Um, MHPN is hosting another webinar um, on the 25th of March and you can go and look at their website for that if you want to. Um, and uh, that is on principles of collaboration. So the actual nitty gritty issues around how we collaborate between sectors with all our bits and pieces, funding and so on.